Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51 Percent, a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, we meet the French woman who called out sexism in Silicon Valley. Former Pinterest COO Françoise Bourra talks to me about why she sued the company for gender discrimination and what the tech sector can do to change the culture. Also, the Congolese scientist who's become one of the most influential in her field on the African continent. But first, and it's a subject we've reported on many a time, sexism and discrimination in the world of high tech. Last year, Pinterest agreed to pay $22.5 million US dollars to settle a gender discrimination and retaliation lawsuit from Françoise Brucher, its former chief operating officer. It was one of the largest ever publicly announced individual settlements in gender discrimination. And, and I am delighted to say that Françoise Brucher joins me in the studio today. Françoise, thank you so much for your time and for coming in. You had a stellar career at Google, at Square. You then went on to join uh, uh, Pinterest. In your opinion, at what stage did things start going terribly wrong? Uh, you see, I was very excited to join Pinterest. Uh, it's a product that has a natural appeal for women. Uh, I was their first ever COO. I was going to be the number two. I was going to have an impact. I was brought in just uh, before we put the company uh, public. Um, and at the beginning, I think we, I went there with very good intention. But very quickly, I did realize that I was starting to be excluded from meeting and decision and things were happening where I was not in the room. And that's the first sign where you are starting to be discriminated when the founder spends some time with his close friends that he has to know for many years that are all men. And uh, you are there and it's very difficult to do your job because you cannot be helpful if you actually do not access the same information that your colleagues. So how hard was it for you to go public about all of this? It was hard. Uh, it's, it's not an easy decision. Um, I also felt because I had a successful career in Silicon Valley, if someone like me doesn't speak, no one will. And if you can think something like this can happen at my level, it can happen at many different levels in the organization. So I felt compelled, I have friends also that felt compelled that I should speak, I should tell my story and hopefully help women behind me, not only to access this level of executive level, but also have a seat at the table, but have a voice at the table, which is very important. What sort of reaction were you getting from colleagues from inside the company as you were experiencing this? Because I, from what I understand, you were the only woman surrounded by men. <laughs> so who were you able to talk to? I didn't talk to anyone. Uh, I, I think it was a really big surprise when once I disappear from the company one day, uh, but more importantly, when I published my blog, I think it was a big surprise for a lot of people. You know, at Pinterest, people did organise a walkout. Now, in a post for Medium entitled The Pinterest Paradox, Cupcakes and Toxicity, a wonderful headline, you described it as a toxic culture where female executives were allowed to be marginalised, silenced and excluded. It's not just high tech, is it, where this happens, Francoise? Yeah, uh, and I can confirm this. You know, initially I wrote this blog post for the Pinterest employee to tell them why I left the company, for the tech industry, because I think it's something that is well known uh, across the board, but I never realized the impact it will have really beyond the tech industry. Um, if you think about it, my blog post has been read by 200 thousand people at this point and women from all over uh, even from Europe have contacted me telling you actually just told my story and that make me um, very proud that I, I was able to capture uh, the problem but what I'm hoping to in the blog post I really focus on the recommendation what do you need to do to actually avoid this problem of toxicity. Were you not facing the potent combination of both sexism and ageism as a woman in her 50s working in the world of high tech? Uh, I didn't perceive it this way. I, uh, you know, when I received my performance review, I got all the qualifier you use for women executives that have advanced very well. So I was 
not that collaborative. I could be abrasive sometimes. So these are all the heavens the qualifier. Uh, there is a very good study done by Karen Snyder that was at Microsoft that had shown in executive review 90% of the women that are at this level get this type of comment where men are being sought as bold and ambitious. And uh, uh, so I, I suffered this. Um, I suffer the fact that and what started uh, my precipitation uh, of my exit of Pinterest, when I denounced a performance review that was telling me my only quality was to be a champion of diversity. So I think when, when uh, so I never felt ages, but I did feel uh, feminist. Now, you also wrote that some 70% of people who use Pinterest are indeed women and the company is steered by men with little input from female executives. This is the ultimate irony, surely. I mean, it doesn't make commercial sense, does it? It does not, and it's not only commercial sense. If you think Silicon Valley is this place where there is this rush for talent and talent are really sought after, if you don't, if you deprive yourself to accept 50% of the talent that is there, uh, it's a really missed opportunity. And we keep seeing uh, figures about the low female representation in the world of high tech. And not only are there fewer women, but they drop out of the industry at a much quicker rate. What does that mean for the sector? And at the end of the day, what does it mean for the final product? Yeah, and that's really the issue. If you think these products are accessible globally uh, by a very diverse population and the decisions are made by the same group uh, of people, it's, it's not the right things, especially when you think about the social impact uh, of this product on the population. I think having different voice in the room will help you design a product that in many ways more human. Do you think, however, that your male counterparts want to hear that? Um, I don't know. You should ask them this question. <laughs> you know, I'm not in the head. And something I don't try to do, actually, is not to be in the head of people because that's not healthy for yourself. Uh, but I advise them to just be much more open-minded. That's a mild way of, of putting it. So are we supposed to wait until the demographics are in our favour in that there are more women in the sector or are there steps that companies can now take in order to correct this issue? For sure. So I try at the end of my blog post, I try to explain there are things you can do right now. Uh, for example, uh, in tech, we really focus on hiring, hiring of women or in diversity. But when you have them in the company, you really need to design an environment that is create justice between people. And it's something that needs to be very deliberate. So people will brag about the number I hire so many women, the same way I was hired as a female COO. But then what do you do that these people can actually be successful, get promoted, get their ID earned, and no system is in place right now to do this. They actually don't even measure it. And I think measuring promotion, retention uh, of this population is very critical. Given that you're no longer working full time in Silicon Valley, what next for you, Francoise? Um, I haven't figured out yet. You know, like everyone else, I dealt with the pandemic and I think it affected a lot of us in many different ways. Um, I don't know if I will take a, a full operational job, uh, 100 hours a week. I think it's a little bit uh, perhaps in my past, but I want to continue to contribute. Uh, I want to help start up. I want to help entrepreneurs design something from the get-go that is designed for a better workplace environment for all. For everybody, men and women included. Exactly. Thank you so much for coming in, Francoise. Thank you so much for having me. Now, in the Republic of the Congo, Francine Natumi is a pioneer in epidemiology and parasitology. She founded the very first medical research centre in her country some 20 years ago and is now widely regarded as one of the most influential scientists on the African continent. Last month, she was appointed as president of the Scientific Advisory Board of France's Research Institute for Development, an organisation that seeks to foster cooperation between scientists in developing nations. Our correspondents in Brazzaville went to meet her. For Professor Francine Toomey, every day is a busy one. As founder of the Congolese Foundation for Medical Research, she teaches both graduate and doctoral students. It's just one of her many roles. 
What happens in two different sites can yield very different results. So the question remains relevant for the Congo. Marcel has just begun his thesis. As a student in molecular biology, he hopes to follow in the footsteps of Professor Ntumi, whom he's known for several years. Professor Tumi has always been a model and a mentor for me. She has taught me since my third year as an undergraduate student and through my master's degree. I like her because she's a fighter. She's a brilliant scientist. Off to the university laboratory. Born into a middle-class family, Francine Tumi began her career specializing in malaria. Now, along with her team, she works on a wide range of infectious diseases found on the continent. We are working on malaria, tuberculosis, HIV. Obviously, right now, we are also working on COVID. And previously, we worked on other epidemics, including chikungunya. The professor is also an advocate for women in science, a sector still dominated by men. I use my own experience and my career to show that as a young woman, it is possible to be Congolese, to have grown up in the Congo, and to achieve scientific success at the highest level. Francine Tumi has received numerous awards throughout her career, including the Mario Prize in 2016. At 60, she's not done shaking up the world of science just yet. And that's it for now. And you can also connect with us via our Facebook page, that of course being France 24.51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. So until our next show, bye for now.